Look at me. I'm black, one of 12 children born into rural poverty in southwestern Virginia. I started life in a two-room shack with no running water or indoor plumbing. We didn't even have an outhouse. We often scavenge for food, hunting, fishing, whatever we could find. No rabbit or squirrel was safe around us. Now this was not true of possums. Even we had our standards. We didn't go to school very often. One year we missed 80 of 180 school days. We all failed that year. I was bullied because of my clothes or what I had in my lunch. Back in those days, having biscuits in your lunch rather than sliced bread was something that could cause you to be teased. My siblings called me Frankenstein due to the scar on my forehead, which you can see is in the appropriate place. They also called me fish eyes. Now anyone who's fish knows that when they come out of the water, the eyes are big and bulging like this. My mother, who might have been considered an early women's liver today, divorced in the 1950s. Both she and the mountain man she would later marry were alcoholics. I was a teen wife at age 16 and a teen mother at age 17. Now social scientists would describe people like me as underprivileged, a victim, going nowhere, doomed to fail. And yet, I didn't. Marriage was my escape. I married a neighbor who was a few years older. My self-esteem was so low. I was thrilled anyone would have me. He had a job and a car, and we were soon building a brand new house thanks to the government's FHA 235 home loan program. All we needed was $300 down, and he had his tax return. I was living better than anyone else in my family, and to them, I was rich. I've always had more than others in my family, and frankly, that has caused me a lot of guilt and grief. It was the 1970s, a time of recession. We didn't have much money or food, but we were not on welfare. I had three children during this time. I can remember walking to the store, one strapped to my chest, one on my back, and one by the hand. I can't remember how I got the groceries home. It was hard times but things were just about to get harder. The last born, my baby, my daughter Tracy, died of crib death. I struggled with depression that led to suicide gestures and I ended up in the mental ward of a hospital. That hospitalization changed the course of my life. My doctor, Dr. Jeff, a young white intern, spoke words that would change how I saw myself. He said, you're intelligent, attractive, and can do a lot more with your life. I was startled. No one had ever said those words to me, and I began to think of myself differently. I remembered that I was once smart. That conversation was the impetus that led me to earn my high school equivalency and take jobs outside the home. I worked in a garment factory as a department store sales clerk. I sold smoke detectors door to door, and I even worked in fast food. For half a day. I was so nervous and shy I couldn't hear or call out the orders. So when someone came through the line, I simply gave them what I thought they should eat that day. The interesting thing is that no one complained. At the end of the shift, I fired myself and turned in my uniform. It was an African orderly, a Muslim from Sierra Leone that I worked with at a nursing home who spoke the words that set in motion my thirst for education. One day in the break room, Abu said, you ought to go to college. I go to school with a lot of people who are not as smart as you are. Until then, I didn't know that college was a possibility. Now think about it. God used two different men of two different races and religions and backgrounds to speak words of life into me that would set the stage for who I am today. I started my educational journey at Virginia Western Community College. I was a work study student in the library. 
the night shift workers frequently called out that always created chaos. Since I was always willing to work, the library director created a full-time job for me, nights and weekends. It was perfect. I could even take my children to work with me. I earned a two-year degree in business in two years. My goal was to become a mall store manager. But when I began applying for jobs, I was told I needed a four-year degree. So... I decided to get a four-year degree. I also decided to become an honor student. So I studied books on how to study, and I looked for the major that had the least amount of math. I landed on criminal justice and graduated from Roanoke College, magna cum laude, while working full-time. The only thing I knew after graduation was that I did not want a career in criminal justice. Like a lot of other blacks, I was going to work for the Government, I can say that. So I went to Virginia Tech and got a master's degree in political science in one year. I was fast at everything. And while I was there, I was pressured to continue my education. I was told that there was a critical need for black professors and black role models. I wasn't interested in any of that. I just wanted a job. I applied for jobs for which I was qualified, and me, an honest graduate, couldn't find one. It was the 1980s, and affirmative action was in full swing. At the urging of my professors, I applied to graduate school and was admitted to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's PhD program and given a generous stipend. Whatever professors or authority figures told me I needed to do for success, I did it. As a student, I gave conference papers and became known across the country. I was a hot commodity. Every job offer included a signing bonus. And during that era, colleges and universities offered minority positions. But I refused to apply to any of those. I chose Princeton. Princeton won because they recruited me the way I wanted to be recruited. I told people that I would earn early tenure, and I did. My goal was to prove that someone from my background could go to Princeton, earn tenure, and earn it early. I'd achieved my goal and was making more money than I ever imagined. I'd won the career prize, the highest a political scientist can win, and two other national prizes for my first book, Black Faces, Black Interests, the Representation of African Americans in Congress, which would eventually receive three Supreme Court citations, and I was miserable. Success did not bring happiness. I experienced rejections from white liberals and prominent black scholars who accused me, a good Democrat at the time, of being a sellout because I didn't share their worldview on issues like affirmative action, poverty, and race relations. I didn't fit their expectations of how a black person should think or act. I was quietly told, almost in a whisper, you don't need to share the story of where you came from. People don't need to know that. My story was an embarrassment to them, but I was never ashamed of where I came from. My success was undermining their narrative, I was not living their truth, and I was being punished for my success, it hurt. I began to question everything I believed, and I began to doubt myself, and the emptiness and the misery sent me on a search for answers. I've always been a seeker of truth, and I've always known there was something much larger than me guiding my life, and I had to find it. My journey took me many places. The turning point was when I ended up in the Princeton Hospital for a physical condition that led to a spiritual experience and culminated in a Christian conversion. My search for meaning and truth had come to an end and I was miraculously delivered from a lifelong crippling shyness. And I've been talking ever since. My conversion caused me to re-examine the world through fresh eyes. As I grew in my faith, I discovered more truths. I had been indoctrinated, lied to, deceived, 
kicked and ignored. I was raised to believe that government protected people and promoted the general welfare. Right? Wrong. Everything the government legalizes is not ethical, correct, or moral. Many times it is the opposite. As a married woman in the 1970s, I was among those first in line for a legal abortion. I reasoned at the time, if it was legal, then it must be okay. The abortion became my deep, dark secret. I kept it hidden and buried for almost two decades. But it was the forgiveness Christ offered me in my 40s that enabled me to confess my sin and the consequences of my choices. Confession and repentance led me to deal with the hidden sin and shame. I shared my story with my two sons, pro-life friends, and eventually the world through op-ed, speeches, and books. But there were other revelations to come. As a political scientist, I now found myself genuinely interested in what the political parties actually stood for. I looked closely at the party platforms. I saw contradictions between what I believed and what the parties preached. And frankly, I was troubled. I had believed that the Democrats were the party for the working man. Democrats were the party of civil rights and Republicans, the party of Lincoln, had abandoned civil rights, embraced white supremacists, and become the defenders of the rich. Everyone knew that, right? Wrong. The Democrats were telling me that I was a victim. I needed the government to take care of me. They had all the answers for people like me. Free housing, free health care, free education, free daycare, free transportation, free, 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 everything for free, no responsibility. Hakuna Matata, no worries for the rest of your life. Hakuna Matata. But I wanted more. So I left the Democratic Party and I became an independent. The problem for me as an independent was that I straddled the middle, which reminds me of a story about an old Texan who said, the only thing that's in the middle of the road are dead armadillos and yellow stripes. So I revisited the party platforms again. This time I began to look more closely at the Republicans. I discovered that many of the things I thought or taught as a professor were lies. I learned that the Republican Party was actually closest to my beliefs about liberty, equality, individualism, free enterprise, free speech, and adherence to the Constitution. Their focus on God, country, and family appealed to me as did their emphasis on traditional values. That is what enabled me to attain the American dream. So once again, I changed parties. I became a Republican. When I was with them, I was embraced and welcomed. I was never treated as a victim. I never encountered racism. The people that I met cheered and celebrated my success because my story is an American story. Academia was changing, as was I. Academia was no longer a marketplace for ideas. It was now hostile to new ideas and free speech. Critical race theory was metastasizing like a cancer and infecting every department of the university and it would eventually pollute K-12 through education. There were demands for safe spaces, trigger warnings, personal pronouns, separate graduations and separate course sections, speech codes, and political correctness. And social justice warriors were on the search for microaggressions, perceived insults or threats to complain about. After 28 years, I made the difficult decision to leave academia and step out into the unknown. I walked away from my hard-won tenure and stepped into a new classroom. Today, my classroom is the world. Today, I use my knowledge and life experiences to give hope to the hopeless strategy for the warriors, and encouragement to the weary. What motivates me today is to see other people 
achieve success. So, my dear friends, welcome to my new classroom. Class is now in session, and here is today's lesson. Many of the things that we've been taught or told to believe are false. What largely determines our success or how far we go is determined by what we believe about the world. Positive change cannot happen if we believe the world is stacked against us and that the ability to change our lives or our world is beyond our control. We each have our own story, our own journey, our own path, and our own destiny. Opportunities abound. We can take advantage of them, waste them, or allow others to keep us from seeing them. Our attitudes and what we believe about the world and the possibilities in it will either free us or hold us in bondage. It's our choice. I chose truth, truth that led me to freedom. The truth is out there for you to know. You can find truth, you can know truth, and it is truth that will set you free. Class dismissed.